Namaste. I'm Dr. Shiram Santi from Chicago, Chairman Gandhi 150 U.S. Commemorative Stamp Initiative, Vice President Gandhi Memorial, Chicago. I was introduced to Mahatma Gandhi in 1986. Though I was born Indian, I never had an opportunity to read in detail about Mohandas Gandhi or Mahatma Gandhi. In 1986, I had the opportunity to visit Sabarmati Ashram with one of my professor's uh, recommendation, Dr. Narendra Sud. And once I went there, I had a, a special transformation in myself looking at the Sabarmati Ashram and the great monumental effort of Mahatma Gandhi to change the world towards truth and nonviolence and obtaining peace through nonviolence. Recently, I have acquired a book of Gandhi at First Sight by Thomas Weber. And while reading the book, I had the thought of presenting the various personalities who described their first impressions of Mahatma Gandhi by adding their photographs and discussing it in detail. This is a, an humble attempt of uh, this Gandhi at First Sight book to be presented to public at large with few of the celebrities that mentioned about Gandhi in that book. Gandhi at First Sight was written by Thomas Weber, an author from Australia, published in 1976. Mahatma Gandhi Memorial and our quotation from Mahatma Gandhi most used was my life is my message. This card was printed at the Heritage Park of Skook, Illinois by Gandhi Memorial, Chicago in 2004. First sight at London Madame Tussaud Museum, Gandhi was seen by Thomas Weber and he describes he was the little brown man in a shawl with an oversized nappy, nappy carrying a stick positioned among those gray men in gray suits stood out. He was the a Time Magazine Man of the Year in 1930, following the celebrated Dundee Salt March, and he was runner-up to Albert Einstein for Man of the Century from 1001 to 1999, the second century. The little brown man in a shawl oversized nappy carrying a stick positioned among those gray men in gray suits stood out. As you see here, the statues of Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., Queen Elizabeth, President Sukarno, and President Barack Obama. Gandhi at First Sight by Dr. Joshua Oldfield. Gandhi's first English friend roommate was a doctor named Josiah Oldfield, or Joshua Oldfield. He met him while a law student in London. Their friendship consolidated by a shared interest in, not to say passion for vegetarianism. For a time, Gandhi and Oldfield shared an apartment in Bayswater, hosting parties where guests were served lentil soup, boiled rice, and large raisins. On other evenings, they sallied together into the world, lecturing at clubs and any other public meetings where they could obtain a hearing for their gospel of peace and health. Josiah Oldfield, he, when he first saw him, describes him as a young, shy, diffident youth, slim and little weakly. As you can see to the left in the picture, at the Vegetarian Society uh, picture in 1890 uh, of Gandhi, who was sitting next to Josiah Oldfield. I, he says, my friend Gandhi, I am proud to say that the only point on which we of the Fruitarian Society disagree with Mr. Gandhi is that Mr. Gandhi will not eat eggs because they contain life. And the ovarian and Fruitarians applauded in that meeting. The other person is Mr. Henry Pollack, a Jewish theosophist, a friend of India and anti-racist campaigner. Mr. Pollack worked with Gandhi at the Indian Opinion uh, Journal 
or publication which Gandhi started in South Africa. He says, Gandhi was a pleasant looking gentleman sitting alone, apart from his black, lawyer's turban and his rather dark complexion, there was nothing specially to mark him out. I could not guess that I was then gazing at the man who was to become the best known Oriental of his time. Again, I could not guess that I was then gazing at the man who was to become the best known Oriental of his time. So says Henry Pollack, a Jewish theosophist. His wife, Millie Pollack, also says he met him in the Jeppe station and uh, he was he looked like a medium-sized man, rather slenderly built, skin not very dark, mouth rather heavy-lipped, a small dark mustache, and kindest eyes in the world that seemed to light up from within when he spoke. His eyes were always his most remarkable feature, and in, rela in reality, the lamps of his soul. Again, his eyes were always his most remarkable feature, and in reality, the lamps of his soul, one could read so much in them. So said Millie Pollack, the wife of Henry Pollack. Mr. Rajan met Gandhi at London to organize a patriotic meeting of 100 Indian students in Great Britain in 1909. He invited him to preside over the meeting. He met Gandhi at 2.30 p.m. without introducing himself. He saw this small, wiry man with a pleasant face, went on to help washing dishes and cut vegetables. Volunteering spirit of Gandhi impressed him the most, so says Dr. T.S.S. Rajan. Sarojini Naidu. The Nightingale of India first met Gandhi in Kensington, London, seated on the floor of an old building on a black prison blanket with a shaven head and eating a messy meal of squashed tomatoes and olive oil out of a wooden prison bowl. In that way, our friendship started, so says Sarojin Naidu, which flowered into a real comradeship and bore fruit in a long, loving, loyal discipleship which never wavered for a single hour through more than 30 years of common service to the cause of India's, India's freedom, so says Nightingale of India, Sarojini Naidu. J.B. Kripalani, another social activist during Gandhi times, has, says he met Gandhi at the Shanti Niketan. And he, he quotes, I saw him take his last meal of the day, consisted of nuts, and I have never seen a man of upper class eat nuts. There was nothing ascetic about his food at that time, Mr. Kripalani says. Rajkumari Amritkaur in 1915 met Gandhi at the Bombay Congress. She says when he approached him, when she approached him, there was a quiet strength and earnestness and a deep humility that went straight to my young heart, and I have felt I owe to him my allegiance. And she became his. Uh, uh, colleague in India's independence struggle. Vinoba Bhave, the Bhutan movement person, met Gandhi at Kashi, and he mentions he's the person in the middle with beard, white beard, in the picture to your left. He found with him both the peace of the Himalayas and the revolutionary spirit of Bengal. The peaceful revolution and revolutionary peace the two streams united in him in a way that was altogether new. Gandhi said, there is no nonviolence without fearlessness. Again, Gandhi said, there is no nonviolence without fearlessness. Babu Rajendra Prasad. Dr. Rajendra Prasad in 1917. He met with Gandhi during the Champaran movement, Champaran and Bardoli nonviolent Satyagraha movement. He says, Babu Rajendra Prasad, most of us who joined Gandhiji in Champaran were lawyers and not one has joined with the idea of giving up the profession. But we, when we started working in Champaran, our whole outlook changed. We found it impossible once we had undertaken it and to go back to our avocation without completing the task at hand. 
Babu Rajendra Prasad has become the first president of independent India after August 15, 1917. Sorry, August 15, 1947. Madeline Slade is another one who got interested in Mahatma Gandhi and his philosophy. As she describes her first encounter, as I entered the room, a slight brown figure rose up and came towards me. I was conscious of nothing but a sense of light. I fell on my knees, hands gently raised me up, and a voice said, you shall be my daughter. So said Gandhi to Madeline Slide. I saw a face smiling at me with eyes full of love, blended with a gentle twinkle of amusement. So said Madeline Slide, who was named Mira Ban by Gandhi in 1925. In 1931, Charlie Chaplin had the opportunity to meet with him in United Kingdom. It was a strange scene in that crowded little slum street that an alien figure entering a humble house accompanied by cheering throngs. I said, I'm somewhat confused by your abhorrence to machinery or industrial civilization. Then the Mahatma said, I understand, but before India can achieve those aims, she must first rid herself of the English rule. Machinery in the past made us dependent on England. To get rid of the dependence, every Indian started spinning his own cotton, so says Charlie Chaplin, the famous actor. Paramahamsa Yogananda of Divine Life Society met Gandhiji at his ashram in 1935, and he asked him because Gandhi always had one day of the week for silence, and he never entertained any guests during that day. And the Mahatma said, welcome Swamiji, but now those 24 hours of silence have become a vital spiritual need. He said, those 24 hours of silence have become a vital spiritual need. A periodical decree of silence is not a torture but a blessing, said Mahatma Gandhi to Paramahamsa Yogananda. Indian Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore has said, Gandhi's simplicity of life is childlike. His adherence to truth is unflinching. His love for mankind is positive and aggressive, and he has what is known as the Christ spirit. The Rabindranath Tagore, who called him Mahatma later on, has said that his simplicity of life is childlike. Nelson Mandela, the liberator of South Africa, said he dared to extort, exhort rather, he dared to exhort nonviolence in a time when the violence of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had exploded on us. He exhorted morality when science, technology, and the capitalist order had made it redundant. So said Nelson Mandela, the first president of South Africa, independent South Africa. Nobel laureate Albert Einstein said, Gandhi had demonstrated that a powerful human following can be assembled not only through the cunning game of the usual political maneuvers and trickeries, but through the cogent example of a morally superior conduct of life. So said Nobel laureate Albert Einstein about Gandhi. Bertrand Russell, a philosopher and an activist, has said, nonviolent resistance, it certainly has an important sphere. As used against the British in India, it led to triumph for Gandhi. But it depends upon the existence of certain virtues in those against whom it is employed. When Indians lay down on the railway tracks and challenge the authorities, to crush them under the trains, the British found such cruelty intolerable. So said Bertrand Russell, a philosopher and a social activist. The Dalai Lama, the Buddhist living guru, has said, to me, Gandhi was the consummate politician, a man who put his belief in altruism above any personal considerations. I was convinced too that his devotion to the cause of nonviolence was the only way to conduct, conduct politics. Again, Dalai Lama says, I was convinced too that Gandhiji's devotion to the cause of nonviolence 
was the only way to conduct politics. Nelson Mandela has written an article on Gandhi in the Man of the Century edition of Time magazine in December 1999, released in January 2000, titled The Sacred Warrior. This is about the liberator of South Africa as he looks at the seminal work of the liberator of India. He says, India is Gandhi's country of birth, South Africa his country of adoption. He was both an Indian and a South African citizen. Both countries contributed to his intellectual and moral genius, and he shaped the liberatory movements in both colonial theaters. He is an archetypal anti-colonial revolutionary. His strategy of non-cooperation, his assertion that we can be dominated only if we cooperate with our dominators. Again, his strategy of non-cooperation, his assertion that we can be dominated only if we cooperate with our dominators, and his non-violent resistance inspired anti-colonial and anti-racist movements internationally in our century. So says Nelson Mandela. Violence and nonviolence are not mutually exclusive. It is the predominance of the one or the other that labels a struggle. Gandhi arrived in Africa in 1893 at the age of 23. Within a week, he collided head on with racism. His immediate response was to flee the country that so degraded people of color, but then his inner resilience overpowered him with a sense of mission, and he stayed to redeem the dignity of racially challenged local Africans. And he stayed in South Africa for 20 years to fight against institutionalized racism. Both Gandhi and Nelson Mandela suffered colonial oppression, and both of them mobilized their respective peoples against governments that violated their freedoms. The Gandhian influence dominated freedom struggles on the African continent right up to the 1960s because of the power it generated and the unity it forged among the apparently powerless. Nonviolence was the official stance of all major African coalitions, and the South African ANC remained implacably opposed to violence for most of its existence. Gandhi remained committed to nonviolence. Mandela says he followed the Gandhian strategy for as long as he could, but then there came a point for their struggle when the brute force of oppressor could no longer be countered through passive resistance alone. He says Gandhi left 21 years later as a near Mahatma, a great soul. There is no doubt in his mind that by the time he was violently removed from our world, he had transited into that state. Gandhi, according to Mandela, is no ordinary leader. He was defined, divinely inspired, and there are those who believe he was divinely inspired, and it is difficult not to believe with them. He dared to exhort nonviolence in a time when the violence of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had exploded on us. He exhorted morality when science, technology, and the capitalist order had made it redundant. He replaced self-interest with group interest without minimizing the importance of self. Again, he replaced self-interest with group interest without minimizing the importance of self. In fact, the interdependence of the social and the personal is at the heart of his philosophy. He seeks the simultaneous and interactive development of the moral person and moral society. His philosophy of Satyagraha is both a personal and a social struggle to really the, realize the truth which he identifies as God, the Absolute. The key traits of Mahatma Gandhi in the presentation has been by the outlooks of all the luminaries who have talked about him in this book. One is the simplicity of living. Second, generosity of thought process. Third, capacity or forceful nature of presenting one's conviction. Electrifying possibility of speech, speaking ability, and veracity of action. Again, simplicity, generosity, capacity, electricity, and veracity.
all these are the ingredients for the success of Mohandas Gandhi in South Africa and Mahatma Gandhi in India. Here is the book which I would like to recommend to all of you to read. There are other, uh, other interactions by other leaders and I had selected few of those for my presentation. Gandhi at First Sight by Thomas Weber. Again, my impressions of Gandhi at First Sight happened in 1986 when I visited with my professor, Dr. Narendra Sood in Ahmedabad, the Sabarmati Ashram. And I was transformed just like he was transformed on June 7, 1893 by Gandhiji's values of morality, peace through nonviolence. Mahatma Gandhi says, that God is truth, and the way to truth is through ahimsa or nonviolence. He said it in 1927. Again, God is the truth, and the way to truth is only through ahimsa or nonviolence. I also had the opportunity to visit the Peter Marisburg station, first in 1999 and recently in 2019, where Gandhi had, the, had a transformative experience on June 7th, 1893 at 9 p.m. where he was evicted from the first class compartment because he was colored and thrown onto the platform of Marisburg, now called Peter Marisburg. There a plaque was installed, says in the vicinity of this plaque, M.K. Gandhi was evicted from a first class compartment on the night of June 7th, 1893. This incident changed the course of his life he took up the fight against racial oppression and his active nonviolence started from that date. This is where the seeds were sown, the thought process of Satyagraha, which followed for everyone's benefit in the liberation of half of the world from racism and institutional racism and social injustices. This was my visit in 1999, where I had opportunity to see his statue in the business district of Peter Marisburg. This is called the Statue of Hope, and where he put they put the most often quoted quotation, my life is my message. This is the Gandhiji statue in Washington, DC. This was in front of the Embassy of India in Washington, DC. This is Gandhiji statue in Dallas, Texas, a big memory Gandhi Memorial Plaza was initiated in, in Dallas, Texas. These are the statues in Atlanta, in the Gandhi King Center, in Cleveland, in Flint, Michigan, New York City, in San Francisco, Salt Lake City, and of course, the one in Washington, DC. This is our statue in Skokie, in the northern suburb of Chicago. Here are the founding members, which included myself, Dr. Shiram Santi at the towards the right of the picture, and Mr. and Mrs. Kamaria Om Prakash and uh, Usha Kamaria on either side of the Gandhiji statue at the base, and other members of Gandhi Memorial Chicago. A second Gandhi statue was brought into Chicago area, and it is to be still to be installed. This was exhibited in the Lions International Plaza in their international headquarters in Oak Brook, Illinois, which I had the opportunity to visit. This is Mohandas Gandhi's article uh, written by Johanna McGarry in the uh, Time Magazine Man of the Century edition, where she says, the Mahatma, the great soul, induced in the best part of our minds, where I, our ideals are kept the embodiment of human rights and the creed of nonviolence. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi is something else, an eccentric of complex, contradictory and exhausting character most of us hardly know. It is fashionable at this fin de siècle to use the man to tear down the hero, to expose human pathologies at the expense of larger than life attachments. Gandhi was runner up to Albert Einstein for man of the century. Mahatma Gandhi, these are the quotations we live by. Where there is love, there is life. 
Gandhi ji says, freedom is not worth having if it does not include the freedom to make mistakes. An eye for an eye only ends up making the whole world blind. You must be the change you want to see in the world. When in despair, remember that all through history, the ways of truth and love have always won. Strength does not come from physic, physical capacity. It comes from an indomitable will. An ounce of practice is worth more than tons of preaching. He says, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. And Mahatma Gandhi says, Gandhi is my name, Ahimsa is my game, and Shanti is my fame. Again, Gandhi is my name, Ahimsa is my game, Shanti is my fame. Here, the president, recent president of United States, Barack Obama, when he visited uh, India during the Independent Republic Day celebration in 2015, has written, what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said then remains true today. The spirit of Gandhi is very much alive in India today, and it remains a great gift to the world. May we always live in this spirit of love and peace among all people and nations. Signed, Barack Obama, 25th January, 2015. This was a, a Champion of Liberty series of stamps released by United States in 1961. And we initiated a Gandhi 150 commemorative stamp initiative in the U.S. on January 9th, 2017, Monday, celebrating the Pravat Bharat Divas in the honorable presence of Council General of India, Dr. Yusuf Syed, with the members at large and chaired by Dr. Sriram Santi. The work is in progress. Hopefully, we'll get the stamp in the coming years. The bibliography. Gandhi at First Sight, book by Thomas Weber, published in 1976. PowerPoint by Dr. Sriram Santi, first presented in 2018. An autobiography of the story of my experiments with truth, Gandhi 150, Navajivan Publishing House, originally published in 1927. M.K. Gandhi, an autobiography, Modern Classics, Penguin Publications, again published in 1927 and 1929. Time Magazine, Man of the Century Edition, January 1st, 2000. Pictures from various sources collected over 30 years. Credits. The concept and narration is by Dr. Shiram Santi, MD. Advisor, Dr. Sharada Purna Santi, PhD. Videography, Yugandhar Nagesh, Swadesh Media. Editing, Yugandhar Nagesh, The Last Five Talks, and Kiranmayi Sargadam, First Talk. Production is funded by Santi Renaissance International Foundation, Flosmo, Illinois. Supported by Center for Ghanaian Studies, Chicago, Flossmoor, USA, Center for Telugu Studies, Chicago, Flossmoor, USA, Gandhi 150 U.S. Commemorative Stamp Initiative, Chicago, and supported in part by Gandhi Memorial, Chicago. This was an appeal to the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee in Washington, D.C. for them to release a commemorative stamp for Gandhiji on the 150th birth celebration. I recommend highly the book of uh, Gandhi at First Sight by Mr. Thomas Weber, so we can reflect on the impressions of many a luminary who have seen them in the earlier part of their lives and later part in, during India's independence. I'm sure we all have our own personal impressions on Gandhi, and most of the time we can experience them better if we visit the number one pilgrimage site to offer homage is Peter Marisburg Railway Station because his transformation on that day to, to include passive resistance or Satyagraha as a part of a movement for peace through nonviolence has obtained freedom for half of the world's population. India, South Africa, Poland, and African Americans in USA through Dr. Marjorie Luther King's efforts. So I wish all of you have the opportunity to witness this presentation and hope you will visit 
Peter Marisburg and Sabarmati Ashram in India to experience the same transformation I felt when I visited both these location, both these places of Gandhiji's transformation. Thank you one and all. Namaste.